Son, Jesus Christ's name, that we do pray. Amen. You know, perspective is a very important dynamic in our lives. I mean, a person we don't like or don't agree with does something and we get all upset. Uh, but then someone we like does the same thing and we give them all kinds of grace and understanding. I mean, do you find that in your life? I remember one time where I was stopped at a stoplight and someone came behind me and tapped my bumper. Now, I'm not sure how much road rage you have, um, but I'm one that's pretty passionate about driving. You know, you'll find me, like, trying to be the Holy Spirit to everyone on the road. But as I, try, as I started turning around and about to, I don't think I was about to flip him the finger, because I don't think I would ever do that. But to do something angry, I noticed behind the wheel is Steve McGowan. <laughs> and he just playing with my head. <laughs> you know, just, you know, realize that, that was back in the day where I drove this beat-up brown Mazda that was probably more damage that would come to Steve's car than mine. Uh, but again, just how radically that changed in terms of my perspective. You know, just in light of the tie that I'm wearing today, an interesting thing happened, you know, in terms of that as well, that there was someone visiting the church for like six months. You know, it was really starting to engage in terms of being here and so on and so forth. And at one Sunday, I told the congregation that I was a Green Bay fan. And he came up after me and said, you know something? Longtime Chicago Bear fans, I enjoy your teaching, but I can't be here. <laughs> and so how that changes some, you know, again, I, but I can't go to him and say, like, I don't understand that. Like, that's a wrong thing to, to think. But for someone who values something in that way, you know, something, again, we would agree that's a very disputable thing. But for that person, it wasn't. And so, again, how perspective leads to a lot of things. Well, I think certainly God's word gives us the right perspective, and that has a lot to do with what Paul is saying in Romans 14 as he addresses the church de dealing with disputable matters amongst themselves. And the perspective Paul encourages the most in these matters is love for one another. You know, how love conditions us, how love gives us a certain perspective in terms of how we would then treat people and ultimately care more about how they would internalize our behavior than living in behavior just because we feel like we have the right to do so. So let's pick it up in Romans chapter 14, verse 19. That's kind of where we stopped last week. And so we want to continue on in terms of just understanding what Paul has to say in this context. And so it says here, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. Now the next slide really represents kind of the outline of what chapter 14 is in terms of what Paul is saying about this issue of disputable matters. I mean, basically in this passage, 19 to 23, he's really emphasizing the idea that the church's opinion matters. Not the church, the organization, but the church, the people, their opinion matters. So we've seen as we've gone through that God's opinion matters. You know, remember it's before the, that, that authority that a servant falls and God is able to make them stand. You know, that perspective is what Paul shared at the beginning. It's, he says that your opinion matters, your mental process, how, how you come along in terms of your development and your conscience, and, and basically, particularly when it comes to disputable matters, you know, no one has a right in this moment to come along to you and say, you're wrong, you're, you're, you're looking at this in the wrong way, so you've got to do it different. You know, Paul is saying just the opposite, that we need to be patient with each other, particularly, you know, I would say even exclusively when it comes to disputable things. And then we saw last week that the unbeliever's opinion matters. Again, don't let what you consider to be good be thought of as bad in terms of what an unbeliever would think about how you use your freedom. And again, verse 19 through 21, really into 23, is speaking about, again, how the church's opinion matters. And now when you think about other people that are believers, those opinion matters as well. I think, though, the most notable thing about verses 19 through 21 is how repetitive Paul is being. You know, again, he's, he's reinforcing the concepts that he's already shared. He's, you know, reinforcing them in terms of what he's saying, uh, supplementing them a, a, as well. But he's really making the same point. And I think what, what we learn from that is just how important this issue was 
to the church in Rome. How, how, how important Paul wanted to address this to make sure that from every single angle, angle every single, certain, single concept that he could come up with to kind of define these things, he wanted to protect the church from the division that can come from these disputable things. And when you think about church history, when you think about the things the church has divided over, and, and, and how important it is for us to understand the same thing. You know, when you think about just the different denominations that we have, you know, the different divisions within those denominations. I mean, are you aware that there are 300 different Baptist denominations? I'm not talking about them. The Baptist is a denomination in itself. 300 just Baptist denominations. You know, when you think about just the minutia that the church has divided over, you know, uh, instruments in church or, you know, certain things about secondary issues, how we handle baptism. You know, you think about in the 90s how the church was divided over worship. Do we do, keep the hymns or would he, do we have the uh, upbeat, you know, worship songs? And how silly it is for us to divide over things that are debatable, that, that two people seeking God and desiring his will really could come to two different conclusions. But rather than arguing that point and dividing over that point, Paul is saying, find that place of unity. Find that, find that place of understanding. Find that place of peace. And that is really where he goes in verse 19. You know, when it says here, let, let us make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification, this whole uh, concept of making every effort, it is a, it is a fair translation of the concept that is that is there but the words are actually to run swiftly in order to catch some person or thing and to pursue something earnestly so the whole idea of this is reaching out pursuing this going after something and what are we going after we're going after this peace we're going after this mutual edification you know, that, that picture of peace that is given here is more about the peace between people than it is about the peace within each other. And so therefore, to what extent are we passionate about that? To what extent are we pursuing that? Uh, to what extent are we making every effort? You know, this word edification is a big word in the scriptures, and it actually talks about building a building. And, and so therefore, when we think about a person and, and what would be required for them to be built up in the faith? You know, having a firm foundation in Christ. Having a firm foundation in the grace and forgiveness that Christ brings. A firm foundation in the word and the principles that are there. A firm foundation in the spirit. And then being guided and built up in terms of the person they are in him as well as the things that they should do. And, and, and that's the idea in the same way that you would approach building a house, the same way that you would approach building a shed or some, some structure, you know, you think about all the care you take to make sure, okay, let's make sure this, this board's in place, let's make sure there's the right kind of nails and strong enough nails and long enough nails and, you know, securing it to the footings and all the things we do to make a building right, well, how much more important is a person? How much more important is a believer? And so therefore, rather than the focus being, you know, I can't, I can't stand that person. I disagree with them so much. I can't stand when they talk about this thing or they talk to me about this thing and they talk about things that are different than me. No, don't think about that. Don't let that be your preoccupation. Yeah, you let your preoccupation be about peace, about harmony, about being together. And again, making every effort to do that. I mean, what does that mean to you? to make every effort to passionately pursue peace and edification. You know, building people up rather than tearing them down. You know, have, having this harmony that should exist. Having the harmony that, that Jesus prayed for, to have the harmony that Jesus encourages, that the Holy Spirit empowers in terms of that. See, I think it, to, to me, what making every effort means is that first, we think about the intentionality with which we operate in our relationships. See, to me, I think it starts with maybe taking an assessment of where I am right now. To what extent do I have peace in my relationships? To what extent is there harmony? To what extent is there's nothing in my heart that I hold against someone else? And hopefully, to the best of my ability, 
that I'm not aware of anyone holding something against me, but certainly being the kind of person that is open to the engagement around fixing things. Because to me, first, it's, it's, it's assessing where I'm at and then intentionally pursuing those things that promote peace and intentionally setting aside those things that don't promote peace. You know, when you think about just the, the pride, the, 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 uh, um, uh, the, the willfulness, the uh, defensiveness that we have sometimes, you know, how critical we can be. You know, how we, we can take something that is true, something that we might correct someone in, but we can do it completely different in terms of promoting peace and pr- promoting edification. See, to me, and, and what we have, I think what we'd have to understand is that it, it can't be that this peace means about agreeing with, about everything. It, it doesn't mean I never say hard things. I mean, there's, that, that's an easy peace to have. You know, is that we have peace between each other because we don't say anything about anything. <laughs> that we just talk about the birds, the sun, the weather, and the kids. And, and, but, you know, some, it, you would be hard-pressed to, to have conversation with people where you don't get to a place where you disagree. Where all of a sudden, well, I don't like the way you raised your kid. I can't believe you spanked them. Or I don't believe you didn't spank them. Or, you know, you give them that much candy. Or, you know, we, we are, well, our worlds are fraught with the potential for conflict, the potential for disagreements. And so, therefore, when we're pursuing peace, it can't be about not saying things, not engaging about, about truth. You know, it has to include sharing corrective information. You know, we have to understand that part of our responsibility in our relations within any body of believers is to be iron sharpening iron, to, to, to be those who have more knowledge and more maturity, sharing in the lives of those people with less maturity, and holding accountable, and, and again, building up truth and pay, building up knowledge and understanding about things. So, therefore, it, has, it can't preclude us saying negative things or corrective things, but it is about what am I promoting in that? What, what am I seeking to develop in that? Again, is it about peace? Is it about understanding? See, again, it's not about my opinion. It's not about me being right, but it is about you being built up. It's about you learning something. You know, I think a, 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 a thing that helps in the context of this is, you know, looking at the log in our eye rather than looking at the speck of dust in another person's eye. You know, I think that is an incredibly valuable principle that Jesus shares in terms of just how we engage with people. You know, how when we're engaging with people, our, our willingness and our ability to say, you know something, yeah, this is how I contributed to that. Yeah, this is what the wrong thing I did. Yeah, I could have done that better. You know, for, for, for us to be leading with that, for us to be always willing to go there rather than always pointing the finger, always saying, no, it's your fault. See, I find, when, even when it is the other person's fault, <laughs> I, I find myself finding things that I have done that it really is my fault or something I did do to contribute that. And, and to me, that's a, just a primary thing of promoting peace because I'm willing to look at myself, not just you, and I'm looking not to defend myself, but to ultimately promote harmony between us. And so again, when you think about just making every effort, passionately pursuing, running after something, Again, it's not this lazy, leisurely, well, yeah, I'll get to it. If I have time, I'll get to it. No, that, that, that it's, 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 what should, it's what should define our relationships. It's what should define us as people. You know, whether we're talking about husbands and wives, we're talking about parents and children, we're talking about brothers and sisters, we're talking about neighbors, we're talking about co-workers, we're talking about, you know, service people and then the customers they're serving. You know, relationships are, are permeate our lives. And to what extent do we show ourselves to people? Like, you know something? What I'm about is I'm a person that pursues peace. That, 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 I, that I'm a person that pursues edification. You know, and I think that, you know, agreeing to disagree is, a, is such an important thing about that. See, because I think there's a peace that we can have with people that 
we still disagree with and finding that place. And I think that's even most important when we're talking about people that are unbelievers. See, I think, the, I think Paul is more talking about the context of the church and how the, the peace that we would pursue ultimately is based in the word. It is based in the spirit. It is based in prayer. You know, it is based in just the knowledge that this is what Jesus desires. You know, one of the things that Jesus prays, you know, as he's leaving the earth, earth is let them be one. You know, let them be together. Let them understand the unity that we have together as the Father and the Son and what we would desire for them to have as people. And so again, let us be the people that are passionately pursuing that, making every effort. You know, maybe the most important thing I would say in regard to this is keep trying. You know, part of, part of what, what I say about myself is I never promise to get it right the first time. Maybe not even promise to get it right the second time, but the third time, the fourth time, like you give me a chance to apologize again or, or, or to have a conversation. And so, so therefore, that's why you, to, to assess where you are in terms of your relationship and then say, you know, how can I promote, promote peace here? So I think promoting peace can't mean giving up truth. You know, giving up our own convictions, but I think there's still a place of peace, of harmony that we can find, you know, particularly when those things are around, are around um, uh, disputable matters. See, I think there's a difference between peace and agreement, you know, peace and, and identification or, or acceptance, like I accept you as a person, but I don't accept the things you, you think or the things you believe. And, and, but I think we still find that place of peace that exists, that place of, of w where, where we do agree. Like, it, e even in the midst of people that you disagree with, there's always some place to find that you do agree on. And just trying to foster truth, trying to foster the knowledge of God in the midst of those things. Uh, so, so again, let, let, us make every, theref let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. It says, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. You know, Paul reveals here that, uh, you know, part of his uh, emphasis and, and part of the, the, you know, one of the main disputable matters in the church in Rome was about food. And we've talked about that before, about why people would have different convictions around food. Uh, but the, the word destroy here is intended to be juxtaposed with edification. In other words, what do I have here? Do you come with hammer and nails or do you come with a wrecking ball <laughs> in terms of dealing with a situation or confronting people? You know, am I doing, okay, you know something? This is going to be a hard conversation. I know I'm confronting them with something that is difficult for them. Well, you know something? Let me make sure that I approach it like a contractor that's trying to secure that wall. You know, that wall is vulnerable, a strong wind, something could happen, you know, it's got some rod over here, and I've got to address that, but let me treat it gingerly to make sure eventually I can get it to stand, as opposed to I'm coming with a sledgehammer, I'm coming with a wrecking ball, and I'm just knocking it over. Again, wh wh what, it, what is our intent? What am I trying to foster? And, and again, that's the, the, those two things are set side by side, and that's, I mean, if you haven't been with me long enough to know the juxtaposition is one of my favorite words. Um, and it's two things set side by side for the sake of a comparison. So it's, it's either are you edifying people or are you destroying them? Are you knocking them down? And, and in so doing, if you do, if you do come with the wrecking ball, you, you, def, you defy the work of God. You go against the thing that God is trying to establish in that person. And to what extent that raises the bar or, or just introduces the thinking that certainly you don't want to be going against him. You know, when you think about the work of God, you know, you think about what Paul has said earlier in this chapter in terms of, you know, the kingdom of God is about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. You know, we just talked about the fact that, um, you know, d d d uh, the f the like, uh, yeah, well, well that, he's, he's talked about the fact of the peace and the edification. You know, that's the, that's the work of God. But then think about the work of God in a person's heart in terms of forming their conscience, in terms of revealing truth to them, you know, bringing them up in terms of what they would perceive to be right, what, we, what they would understand in terms of the freedoms they have. And here you come along and you destroy that. 
you corrupt that process and thereby destroy the work of God. And so again, food is not, as, is not important enough. That disputable matter is not important enough. Food, drink, whatever, is not important enough in terms of the work of God that is there. You know, in the second part of, of 20, he does, he does affirm, you know, what he believes. Um, you know, all food is clean. You know, there's nothing wrong about the nature of the food that makes it unclean. Uh, but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. You know, that there are issues with food at that time. You know, primarily it would be about how much blood is in an animal. Like there would be Jewish restrictions about the meat not having blood in it. It would have to be with whether it's a clean or unclean animal. And as we've seen, we, it could also be about whether that meat was uh, purified or was brought before an idol for, for it to be purified by the idol, you know, in terms of the faith that, you know, that the pagan religions had. And so some people would say, well, again, all those things don't matter anymore. We're free to eat any, everything and other people wouldn't, and Paul's point is, yeah, it's all clean, yeah, it's all good, but certain people don't think that way, so because for them it would be wrong to do it, then you shouldn't do it in front of them, and therefore cause them to stumble that they eat, and, and their, their conscience is corrupted. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. So, so, so basically, Paul is, you know, focusing on this issue of food, but then he translates that and, and basically expands it to all issues that are disputable. A anything that, again, you might argue a point for or against in terms of that. Um, you know, it's, 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 just, it's just funny how, you know, different people have different takes on things and how they would come to different conclusions in terms of, well, I really believe the Bible says this, or I really believe that God says that. And it's like, really? Well, like, here's what I think about that, and this is what I understand about that. And, and, and yet, you know, negotiating through that in terms of uh, you know, not, not, not promoting or, or lifting high or just living out what I would consider to be a freedom that I have um, in, in, in light of a weaker person's conscience, a younger believer's conscience, and, and just you know, again, building that up and, and, and promoting peace in that and certainly not doing anything that would cause them to stumble. So moving on into verse 22. Uh, yeah, now there is, I mean, there is a point to be made um, that it would be God and Paul's desire for the weak not to remain weak. In, in, in other words, for, for someone that thinks that they shouldn't eat this food, you know, they shouldn't drink this thing, that they, they shouldn't do something that is disputable in nature, that the Bible doesn't specifically say, the Bible specifically doesn't call it wrong, and so therefore there's freedom to do this. You know, I think there's an aspect of how, you know, how we define our lives, how we choose to be. Like some people would say, my gosh, you're going to a doctor? You're, you're taking medicine? Don't you know a true believer doesn't go to a doctor? They don't go to a blood transfusion? You can't have a blood transfusion. Be, you know, all the different things that come up that people have, like a man has long hair? What, what do you... You know, all these things that people talk about, and, and, the, and these are the things of our time that we would address, and, and so, we, so, so, so therefore the point I'm making is that, I mean, ultimately God would want the conscience to be informed by the word, you know, rather than tradition or presumption or, or uh, you know, a, 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 a denomination in terms of what might be supporting that, a family tradition, that would be supporting that disputable matter, but, but God would want our consciences to be informed by the word, for us to have the freedom that we're supposed to have and, and keep ourselves from those things that we're supposed to keep ourselves from. But, but again, when it comes to disputable things, not, not prioritizing things more than the word of God does. And so, so basically, you know, uh, the reason why Paul like, reinforces the point that the strong would make like the point the strong one make is all food is clean. 
So, so he puts it out there, but then says to the strong, just don't follow that. And, and that really is affirmed in verse 22. And we kind of you know, mentioned this first verse last week, but didn't really get into it. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and everything that does not come from faith is sin. And, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that this word faith is both in verse 22 and verse 23, that, that, that Paul is making, you know, what the, how the strong are conducting themselves and how the weak are conducting themselves to make sure that what they're doing is based in faith. What they're doing is based in Christ. What they're doing is based in the Word. It's based in what God says about how we should live, be living. Um, and so therefore, God, Paul does not say here that what is wrong for someone else, I mean, Paul does say here, let me say, let, Paul does say here that what is wrong for someone else does not become wrong for you, but the place to engage in it is privately, not publicly. And, and, and so that, that's where we have the understanding that we, we ultimately live our lives before God. So therefore, this, this thing that I can do, you know, let's use the example of drinking, this thing that I could do in drinking alcohol, that there's freedom to do that as long as it doesn't lead to drunkenness. If, 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 if someone would be, that would be a stumbling block to, person, to a person, it would lead someone that thinks it's wrong to, to, to do something that would br defy their conscience. I do that privately. I keep it to myself and God because I know I have that freedom that, that God would say. And so, again, that, that, again uh, one of the other uh, common things that might be debatable in our, in our world today. Because basically, you know, this whole point that is on the bottom, I think is, is predominant for Paul. We're blessed when our consciences are clean and clear. You know, we, you know when we understand what the conscience is for, that, that is the internal monitor. That is the thing inside us that God has given us to say, hey, here's the, here's the conviction, here's the point, you're going down a wrong road, stop it. <laughs> You're going down a right road, keep doing that. You know, God intends the conscience, really, it's, it, in some ways, really what it should be. It should be the word on its feet. It should be the word walking around in life. It should be as we engage with the word, word and we have the principles in our, in our hearts, that the conscience should be the one that's informed by that. So when all of a sudden we're in a situation and, hey, why don't you lie? hey, you can do this thing, and no, the conscience comes up and says, no, don't do that. that. That's not the right way. I mean, God loves when, again, our consciences are clear and, 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 and clean. You know, clear in terms of not judging ourselves for things we shouldn't judge ourselves for. You know, when it says here, blesses the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. You know, when, when, when God gives us freedom to do something, we shouldn't feel a bad, be feel bad about doing it. That, I mean, that's really what it's what what it, what it's pointing to. But if we're if we're letting, you know, again, tradition or or our own opinion or or just our own guilt drive us towards that, or I let the opinion of other people or the guilt that comes from other people stop me from doing something, again, that's where you know we just have to understand that our consciences. You know, it, it, but the way it's supposed to engage with us, how we're supposed to engage with that in terms of motivating life and informing life, th th you know, that has to be healthy. It has to be the way God wants it to be. And again, we're blessed when we're in that place. We're blessed when we don't approve things we shouldn't approve and we don't condemn ourselves with things that we should con be condemned, uh, to, that we shouldn't be condemned for, but we're condemning ourselves. You know, when it says in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now, con now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. I mean, basically, for, for Paul to affirm that what the righteousness and forgiveness that Christ brings us means that God will never condemn us in terms of trying to teach us. That, that, that whatever, whatever condemnation we might face is always from the kingdom of darkness. That is his means to condemn us for things for things that we haven't even done that are wrong, or things that have been forgiven, 
bringing up the thing you did five years ago, two years ago, six months ago, and, and causing you to be guilty over that rather, rather than trusting in the forgiveness that Jesus offers you. And, and so basically, that, that's the whole point of Paul, that, that you, know, you have to understand as a strong, you can't abuse someone else's conscience by what you're doing and therefore corrupt the work of God. You know, because again, God is, God is developing and transforming that conscience, and he wants to do it with, with all of us. Uh, so again, we would be in that place of blessing, of that place of harmony with God, that, you know, something I'm informed by God, and I'm, I'm proving what he would approve, and I'm not allowing myself to be condemned for things he would not co- you know, correct me for. He would never condemn me about anything, but correct me, correct me for. And, and that's kind of what the conscience is all about. But it says here, the man, but the man who, who has doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith. And so this is the other concept that Paul wants to reinforce about how so many of our decisions are based in the things that we believe. So many of our decisions are based in faith, and we reflect that faith in what we do. I think Paul's point here, again, just for the sake of those that weren't here uh, you know, before, you know, I think we can understand what Paul is saying here. That, that, you know, in other words, if you think that um, you know, shellfish is something God would not want you to eat, that you can point to Scripture that says don't eat shellfish, and so therefore I'm convinced I don't eat shellfish. But you see someone else who's a believer that recognizes that God changed that in the book of Acts and allows us to eat shellfish, and so therefore if you're eating shellfish, and by virtue of you, in the freedom of your conscience, you eat shellfish, but by your eating, you have someone who doesn't have that, freedom in their conscience and they eat it see what paul is saying is that is wrong for them because the minute you think something is wrong before god for you to do it it's wrong you know and 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 that doesn't that make sense you know i mean really what it reveals is that god is a god looking at your heart god is a god who cares about what's in your thinking god cares about what you believe and what you think about things and the minute you take something where you say, God, I real, realize in my relationship with you, my conviction of the word, you wouldn't want me to do this. Now, you've seen believers five times, you know, doing the very same thing, but you don't believe that. Do you see how if in your life you say, God, I'm going to do that, you're defying your own conscience, you're defying what's in your heart? And that's what Paul is saying here, whatever is not of faith is sin, that if you think something's wrong and you still do it, then it's wrong. You know, but I think you know, what this highlights to us is just the, just the importance of faith in our life. Ju- just how, uh, how the, the very thing that connects us with God is this element of faith that is, is, is about believing what we don't see. Of having a hope that is not confirmed in substance. You know, for a world... That is, that, that, that is aligned with and connected with sense, with sight, with hearing, with taste, with touch. If I touch it, it, it's real. If I can see it, it's real. Well, you know something? What faith says to us is that the best things that are real are things you can't see. And that when you think about God revealing himself to us, you know, th- th- that... that even though we see the evidence of God in our world, we have never seen God, but we believe that he is there, and that's the faith that God calls us to. And so, so to, to what extent are we believing? To what extent do we have that faith? And I think that uh, you know, perspective and the faith that makes it right are, are the key. And the same way that without faith it is impossible to please God, anything that is outside of faith is sin. So again, this the essential nature of faith. That even when we think about that verse that says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And no, it's even if you're doing the right thing and you don't believe something about God in doing that, if faith is not the thing that's deriving that, then guess what? It's not pleasing to God. You're bringing food to the poor. You're walking old ladies across the street. You're coming to church. 
doesn't mean anything, doesn't please God if it's not based in faith. See, the minute you make that a work, maybe God, uh, you're pleased by the fact that I'm doing this. I'm taking this action. No, I'm pleased by the faith that is driving that action. Now, on the other side of that, to say you have faith without action, God would say that's not real faith. And so, therefore, it is the action and the faith that is driving the action, convicting of the action, that is an essential part of the Christian life. And, again, I think it's wise for us to think, and we might have to do a little bit of this next week, um, because I think what this verse does, in terms of verse 20, 23, uh, you know, at the end when it says, everything that does not come from faith is sin, that it makes faith much more important and far more practical. You know, that, that faith is not about an assi- assessment or, or, or a, a, an agreeing with a creedal statement. Okay, here's the creed. Here's I, you know, I'm, I'm a believer and I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he died on the cross and all. You know, that, that, I mean, there's an aspect of faith that is about that. But then the other part of faith is, how am I engaging with life? To what extent, as I'm making decisions, are those things reflective of faith? You know, I, I, would, I would say that the majority of our decisions are fairly innocuous in nature. They, they don't have any moral import. You know, you go to work, you have dinner, you, know, you go to lunch and... You know, you're going to have lunch at some point in time today, and you know, you're, you're, you're really not engaging with moral things or issues of conscience when, that, when, that, when that's going on. But I think in some ways the faith of God undergirds every aspect of life. But then when we're doing life, we're interacting with people, and all of a sudden an issue of morality comes in, an issue of faith comes in, all of a sudden, there's fear that riles up in my heart. There's lust that comes up in my heart. There's anger that comes up in my heart. Now, all of a sudden, what does faith dictate in that? You know, and to the extent that I'm not living in faith, then that is sin. Wherever my behavior or my attitude or my action, or again, what's going on in my conscience, that I'm not living my life out consistent with the faith that I have, well, then that is sin. You know, because when you think about what is, what is the core of faith? The core of faith is dependence on God. An awareness of God and dependence on God. The core of sin is independence from God. And so therefore, to the extent we don't believe God in things, well, that is sin. Because what we're showing in not believing is that we're independent from him. That we don't need him, we don't believe him, we don't trust him in terms of what he is saying. And so what I figured we would do in terms of just flushing out this whole concept is just looking at those areas where, where I think sometimes we are challenged in faith. We're challenged to believe. And the first thing really does have to do with unbelievers. You know, so how is your faith, the faith these days? And that is believing that God even exists. You know, where are you in terms of just the affirmation in your heart that God is real. You know, when you think about the primary questions that need to be resolved in that is, where do we come from and who is Jesus? You know, I think more often than not, what the world is being tripped up on are are the actions of believers or the example of believers or certain principles that are in Scripture. And yet the starting point really should be, who is God, where do we come from, and who is Jesus? And when you think about all the Bible would say, in t- or not the Bible, but what the world would say, what, what the creation would say about the reality of God, the reality of God being our creator, you know, I think more and more what science is going to, be, what science is going to find is that there is irreducible complexity in creation. That as far as they study, as far as they look at things, that they just can't help the idea that this couldn't happen by accident. You could have trillions and trillions and trillions of years, and it still couldn't happen. That when you think about the systems that happen in terms of geology and cosmology 
and the human body and environment and ecosystems and all the different things that make things work. There, there is too much miracle. There is too much wonder. There is too much intelligence in all of it that, again, it, 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 at some point, it will become undeniable. You know, on Wednesday night, we're in a passage in, in the book of Acts where in the church of the Ephesus that, that, you know, God is doing miracles, Paul is doing miracles, you know, people that are evil are being disciplined by God, and, and it says people in droves are coming out, and they're, they're burning their witchcraft elements, and they're, to, you know, ridding themselves of the things that are apart from God. And the point I see in that passage is that the power of God was undeniable, that they couldn't help themselves being confronted by the power of God. This has to be true. This has to be real. If it is, I have to be transformed. I have to take, you know, set aside the things that I was helping define life and, and define, my, define my life by God and who he is. And I think when you truly assess creation, I mean, when you think about the answers the world has, when you think about the answers science has, you, you, you have to realize that um, you, you have to believe that too. See, you have to have, I would say you have to have more faith in terms of what it says and to, to in terms of an evolutionary process that there's no evidence for at all, and yet the evidence in terms of a divine creator, an intelligent designer, I think that more and more as we get better at assessing creation, we are going to see that th there's just too much wonder here. That, that you know, they, they, keep, they keep, you know, looking at the, the, at the extents of the universe, and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Like, they're waiting to find a wall, and there is no wall. That that creation is just finite. And why is it there? To manifest God's glory. To show humankind that, hey, I'm here, and I'm real, you know, I find it interesting that the world is very passionate about finding life in other places. You know, realize that for us as believers, it's no problem for our faith at all if life is found someplace else. But if life isn't found someplace else, that's a real problem for evolutionists. evolutionists. Like if their principle is life just happens, life just makes, it, makes itself grow, well, why doesn't it happen in other environments? Why isn't there some other organism that could make it on Venus? It could make it on Neptune. It could make it on Mars. If, if again, if, if, if life and, and, and just the elements that are part of a creation that came together by accident had the means of producing life, well, why on just one planet in an expansive universe is the only place that it exists? See, to me, that's intention. See, to me, that's design. To me, that's care. To say, yup, one place is going to be fitting for the people that I create to live. And, and, and just, you know, what, what, what problem that is for evolution in terms of they, ha they, ha they haven't found life. You know, they're, they're excited when they just find water. Some aspect of water. Well, what's, what's a big deal? You well, for them, water is the, is the, that's the mother of life. That's where life comes from. But, but really, like, all these other places have had, a, you know, all these, all these other planets and all these other uh, galaxies have had as much time, or I mean, relative in, in cosmic years, you know, the same time that we have had to develop. And so therefore, wh where is it? Wh where, where's the proof? Wh where's the, 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 the indisputable accounting of what happened in terms of where we came from that would, that would set aside the truth and majesty of God revealed in a creation that it cannot be explained. It cannot be broken down. You know, as much as we say, you know, they, see, they, they search the uh, outside universe, the cosmology, and, they, and it's, it's never, it's always getting bigger. They go smaller, and it just keeps getting smaller. And, and, and I, I do believe that creation is infinitely smaller and infinitely bigger. That they were going to find the quarks that are the this and it has this element and that element. And you know something? They're going to come to a place where it's just not, it's unexplainable. 
But then beyond that, to think about Jesus, to think about the life he lived, the person he was, the death he died, the miracle of his resurrection. Again, those are the places to start because, because if God is real, if God exists, now all of a sudden he, we're accountable to him. Now all of a sudden we have to wonder who is he and why has he made us? And see, that's where Jesus comes in, where Jesus comes to represent the Father as God to show us this is what God was about. This is what God sought to do. This, this, is, this is the provision that God is making to make you right with him. And so to think about the miracle of who Jesus is, the miracle of how he came, the miracle of what he performed, the miracle of his, of his resurrection, and see, those are the places to start. Like you're wondering, okay, what is gonna what is gonna convince me to make that leap of faith to say, yes, I believe in Jesus. Yes, I want salvation. Yes, I want connection with God. Is first to really assess, really? You have better answers in terms of where we came from? You have like you have argument to say, no, Jesus was false. He was wrong. He, he, he wasn't, he didn't do what he did. He, he didn't die the way he died. He wasn't raised. See, that's the opposite of faith. The opposite of faith is rejection. And so really, you're going to reject that why? Like, have you really assessed how God is revealed, how God is manifest? Oh, but I don't like this part of Scripture. I don't like what it says about this or that. Eh, don't, don't start there. Because just like you, you, you engage with God in terms of the understanding he has and the glory that he is, now all of a sudden you, you believe and understand why he has said what he has said. But the, but the fundamental aspects of that are, where did you come from and what about the cross? But we'll, we'll talk about some other things uh, that, I, that I think press our faith. Uh, to, to, you know, as we think about, okay, if... And everything that does not come from faith is sin. That, that, that faith is a, is a fundamental aspect of the Christian life. And I think there are certain things in our lives and our world that press us in that faith. And we'll have to get to that next week. Let's bow and let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for your word. Uh, we do thank you for uh, just what kind of people it makes us. We, we thank you for the love and the kindness that you empower and make possible in us. I thank you for the truth that you do make undeniable for those who would see and those who would be willing. I, I just pray that this morning, uh, both those joining us online and those here would be willing, uh, wi willing to open themselves up to a God that, that has manifested himself in creation, a God who has revealed himself in Jesus and, and just accomplished great things through him, both in his life and his, in his death and his resurrection. And so, Father, I, I just pray uh, that you draw people to yourself, that, that you make your presence with them. Uh, Father, bless their seeking as they seek for you with all their hearts. And, Father, for the rest of us, I, I just do pray that you would uh, confront us where maybe our faith is, fa uh, is failing. Uh, confront us with the, the things we're not believing you about. And, and just help us to see ju just how a lack of faith in you is at, is at the foundation of every act of disobedience, of every willful thing. It's ultimately believing something about the lie and not believing something about the truth. And so, Father, I just, I just pray that you, that you help us to make those kind of connections in our hearts. And so we just thank you for our time together, and we just lift these things before you in the matchless name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.